Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So first of all, good afternoon. Um, I'm Michael Novotny, uh, CEO of co-founder of Krippon Labs. I used to be a mathematical finance professor at Boston University. Um, what I learned being an academic is very pertinent to what we're doing here in decentralized finance, making sure that we develop an ecosystem that's not only efficient and fair, but also lets us do next generation things, things that have never been able, we have never been able to do before in any of TradFi. So what I'm going to focus the talk on is the problem of high cost in trading in decentralized systems. There's, of course, trading cost in TradFi, but in DeFi, it's simply out of control. Luckily, we can fix this by looking at things at a different perspective. So traditionally speaking, there are two types of costs that make trading very expensive. They exist in TradFi, and they exist in DeFi. One of them is front-running. The other one is adverse selection. Front running is extraordinarily well known and well understood in decentralized finance. So basically, it's the knowledge of impending order flows and trying something to get ahead of that order flow. On blockchain ecosystems, that's typically implemented by colluding via a miner or a validator in proof of stake systems. So the way this works is miners have the right to choose what order transactions should go into the block. And they can either front run themselves or they can sell this right to the highest bidder via some system like Flashbots. And that's what happens. So they get additional money in addition to the block reward and addition to transaction fees by reordering blocks or transactions in a block or simply selling that privilege. That's front running. It's fairly well understood. Adverse selection is a problem that has existed throughout all of finance. Basically, when you're a market maker, you provide immediacy, you provide liquidity, but you never know whether someone who wants to trade against you has more information than you do, they're trading for information-related reasons, or they're trading like most of us because they want to rebalance their portfolio. So think about a mutual fund manager. That fund manager has inflows and outflows, and so they need to buy and sell to meet those inflows and outflows. Or think about someone who basically just wants to rebalance their portfolio. They're not trading for information-related reasons, but the market maker doesn't know that. The market maker must always assume the probability that someone comes to them who knows more than they do, who gets some element of price-relevant information before they do. And if they do, they decide what's good for them and what's bad for the market maker. If they have positive news, then they buy from the market maker. If they have negative news, they sell to the market maker. So for the market maker, that's a systematic cost. That cost has always existed. And in order to still be profitable, what the market maker needs to do is they need to charge a bid ask spread. The higher this information asymmetry is, the higher the spread they need to charge. Now, what I'm going to focus on in this talk is adverse selection, not front running. What we've done at Krypton Labs is we have come up with a different take, a different perspective on trading that very elegantly solves both adverse selection and both front running. It's not a technical solution, it's an economic solution. It's based on first principles. But let's first have a look at um, the magnitude of our problem. So what this graph shows is 18 months of adverse selection in a single Uniswap version 3 pool. That's the pool for ETH versus USDC. And so as we see, more than $100 million were lost to market makers or to liquidity providers even after accounting for trading fees. So it's a very bad proposition to market make on Uniswap. Um, in these automated market makers, this is typically known by the euphemism impermanent loss, but as you can see from this graph, it's nothing. Uh, it's not impermanent at all. So it's very, very permanent. Okay, and so what we'll try to investigate now is where is this coming from and how can we fix it? So interestingly, academics have come up with a metric um, to measure the probability that a market maker is facing a toxic trader, an informed trader. And this measure is known as VPIN, the Volume Adjusted Probability of Informed Trading. Now, interestingly, this measure was co-invented by Maureen O'Hara, who is a professor at Cornell and also happens to be an advisor to Ava Labs. Now, what this metric does is it comes up with a number that's between 0% and 100%, um, if the number is 50%, it means that the market maker can expect to be adversely selected to lose on 
every other trade, on 50% of the trades. So let's take a look at what this measure is in TradFi. So this picture basically shows a time series of prices and this VPIN measure on the same graph, um, spanning four years from 2007 to 2011. And this is for the S&P 500 index. So um, widely known equity index, it basically covers um, two periods of interest. One of them is the global financial crisis. The other one is the so-called flash crash of 2010. And so as you can see, this measure, this, um, this VPIN, basically moves around, hovers at around you know, 20% most of the time. During times of market stress, it can go up to even above 40% in traditional equity markets. And um, during 2010, during this flash crash, basically this measure went up and up and up. And at some point, market makers just decided it's too risky for them to be in the market. They just sold everything and they basically withdrew from the market. And then prices fell off of a cliff. And this has, of course, been investigated by the SEC because they don't like this. You know, regulators, and I guess all of us, like fair and orderly markets where you can actually transact. All right, so um, we computed the VPIN in crypto, and we computed this for two very different kinds of exchanges. So what you see in the graph below, in the line below, is basically VPIN for Binance. And so this is for the ETH um, USDT order book, and so, yeah, it hovers around 10%, so maybe a little bit lower than uh, VPN in equity markets, then if you compute it for Uniswap, um, you get the line on top. And so you see that uh, trade toxicity, the probability of being adversely selected to a market maker is actually about four times as much in DeFi as it is in TradFi, right? And so one important thing to note is that in TradFi, in equity markets, adverse selection still exists. They use order books. So an order book system that we can now do in decentralized finance is not actually a solution to adverse selection. It is just better than an automated market maker. So our prediction is that automated market makers will go away and they're gonna be re replaced by something, maybe by order books or by advanced order books, which is what we're doing at Krypton. Um, so you might ask, why is this the case that um, an AMM is so incredibly inefficient that it makes it so incredibly costly, right? Because um, all of us have to pay uh, the, the profits of these toxic traders. This is both you know, liquidity providers, but then also active traders. It's just incredibly, incredibly expensive. And so the reason is that adverse selection basically comes from some sophisticated, fast actor having a short-lived information advantage against the market maker. Now, what information does an automated market maker have? Nothing, they don't know anything. In fact, the only reason an automated market maker can know what the right price is is to be adversely selected to the maximum for some arbitrageur to come in and correct the price. That's the reason why we see this trade toxicity. And so if you think about it, on order books, on centralized exchanges, the cost, society has already paid the cost to find out what the right price is, right? This adverse selection cost has already been paid. And so why do we now have to pay it, you know, multiple times over in DeFi just to import that price? That's just extraordinarily inefficient. What we also understand, um, is that likely, if this persists, institutional traders will not come to DeFi because they just can't justify that cost. If we, another way of looking at this is um, looking at the percentage of trades on Uniswap that are initiated by toxic traders. And so it is very well known that more than 50% of all trading volume on Uniswap is caused by toxic traders, is caused by addresses that are known meth bots. Okay, and so there is some 21% that it's unaccounted for. We don't know who they are. They could also be toxic traders. So there are some people who are winning big time on Uniswap and others, like the market makers who lost these $100 million, even in a single trading pair, they are losing. And even if you're not a liquidity provider to Uniswap, you're also massively losing because of this extraordinarily high trading cost. So one might ask the question, well, if this is so inefficient, why is the AMM mechanism the dominant mechanism in decentralized finance? And so fundamentally, the reason is technology, it's technological cost. If you think back um, a few years ago, before the existence of high scalability DeFi solutions, of high scalability blockchains, such as Avalanche, there was only Ethereum. But if Ethereum is the only decentralized ecosystem where you can make transactions, then the fundamental problem is that everyone wants to be there and there just isn't enough block space. So if you were to do anything sophisticated, then you would basically um, have to pay a lot of gas, you have to pay a lot of transaction fees. So in order to come up with a mechanism 
kind of that's barely usable, where you do, do not get killed on these crazy high gas fees, you have to do something that's very simplistic. Now, think about how does an order book work? How do these organized symmetrical market work, markets work? They basically work by an active market maker or active market makers continuously having to revise their bids and asks. In a decentralized system, doing that means that you have to always make an on-chain transaction. If these transactions are expensive, then the market maker has to charge a very high bid ask spread in order to recover these transaction fees. If the system, like Ethereum, is just too expensive to do it, then the bid ask spread the market maker would have to charge is just much higher than the crazy high cost on these AMMs. That's why AMMs won. That's why they dominated in a setting of high technological cost. But that's no longer the world we live in. Like as of 2023, we certainly have scaling solutions. We have side chains. We have more scalable layer ones. We have all kinds of rollups. And of course, we have Oracle networks like Chainlink. And we can use those. We can use those to make decentralized transactions relatively inexpensively and optimizing for low computational complexity, for low um, block space usage is simply no longer the right trade-off to make. What we can do now is we can come up with systems that are just much more economically efficient, that prevent these um, toxic trading schemes, that prevent front running, that prevent adverse selection, and that go are going to lead to the future of decentralized finance and hopefully institutional adoption. One thing that um, typically is not talked about much is if you think about it, a toxic trader also needs to pay transaction fees, right? So they also need to pay gas fees, even if they are the miner or the validator that wins the block. So if the cost for them to front run and to adversely select becomes lower, then it just means that they're going to exploit more and more opportunities profitably. So the problem I'm, gonna, I'm describing here is just going to be dialed up to 11. It's just going to become much worse. And so I would say, in short, um, the legacy DeFi protocols, like these AMMs and others, they are simply built for a world that no longer exists. So what we're going to do now is we're going to discuss kind of what world might exist and what is kind of, what is kind of the best thing to, uh, to do in this world. And so, as you understand, in TradFi, most trading comes from institutions. Most trading in global finance comes from institutions. Institutions are extraordinarily cost sensitive. If you think about a mutual fund manager or a pension fund manager, if they can um, create an alpha of 1% per year, so that's a risk adjusted outperformance of 1% a year, they're golden. They're not going to lose their job. They're going to make a big bonus. Trading in DeFi once can easily cost you more than 1%. So all their skill, all their aptitude is going to be lost if they're just making a DeFi trade once. That's why they're staying away. And you see how if we're continuing on the path we've been, con we've been on, then um, we are simply not going to succeed. It's just not going to work out. So we need something different. And so um, what, we, what we might now think about is maybe there are other solutions. So there are solutions which try to address minor extractable value or maximum extractable value, right? So there are things like cryptographic commit and reveal schemes, there are things like order randomization schemes, all these kind of things. But it's important to know that they only target front running. They do not target adverse selection. Adverse selection also leads to MEV, and it's a big problem. So these solutions are not comprehensive. Now, one might think, OK, so we could just do an order book. I mean, order books have existed and tried five for a long, long time. But as I just showed, adverse selection also exists in order books and the cost can be massive. So maybe we can do something better. And that's the idea at Krypton. So what we want to do is we want to go back to first principles and actually analyze the incentives from an economic perspective, from a game theoretic perspective, to find out if we can create a mechanism that does not have these problems. And that's, I think, actually the opportunity in decentralized finance. We can basically invent whatever we want, and no one can stop us. So we can really re-architect the system and finally find a way that is not just as efficient as traditional finance, but is even more efficient. And that will enable things that have never been possible. So if you think about financial markets from an economic perspective, one of the purposes is optimal risk sharing. Right? So you are exposed to some idiosyncratic risk. You trade against someone else, and maybe you can share some of that risk. Or you bear some part of 
systematic risk, and you can trade that. You can share that. This is the idea of an insurance. Now, because of these high trading costs, both in TradFi and decentralized finance, there is very, very incomplete risk sharing. And we can just make that better, and we can come to a world where things are possible that have never been possible before. And so what I'm going to... Uh, the point I want to drive home is that um, most others have been trying to think of some patches, you know, something to tack on to existing trading mechanisms in DeFi. They've looked at this problem as a technical problem. But if you think about front-running and adverse selection, they exist in TradFi where there is no blockchain, where the technological environment is much, much different. So these problems are not technological problems. They are fundamental systematic economic problems. And we need an economic solution, and that's exactly what we do. So to briefly analyze the problem, um, if you think about the way that trades are implemented, both in TradFi and in DeFi, both in order books and automated market makers, essentially on a central limit order book, whenever an aggressive order hits a passive order and can be matched, then according to some price and time priority rule that defines the matching engine, the maximum quantity that can be transferred is being transferred in a single instant, right? And so if you construct a quantity, think of it as trading speed, most of the time in these order books or on automated market makers, trading speed is just zero. No trade happens. But whenever a trade comes, whenever an aggressive order hits a resting order, then in a single instant, a finite quantity is transferred all at once. So finite quantity divided by zero time means infinite trading speed. So the history of trading speed, the time series of trading speeds, is essentially um, a Dirac delta function where most of the time it's zero and it just jumps up to infinity. And so what that does is it makes it enormously crucial what the sequence is in which these trades are implemented. That's why there is value in being first. That's why it is value to be a miner or to be a validator and to sell that block space, sell that privilege to the highest bidder. That's why in TradFi, people are spending enormous amount of money to vie for low latency solutions, like building optic fiber cables through mountains and you know, building series of microwave towers and so on and so on and paying for co-location. If you're just a few microseconds faster, you can take advantage of the entire opportunity, whatever that opportunity is, if it's front-running or it's adverse selection. So if infinite trading speed and trading in these kind of singular bursts, that's the problem, then why don't we just not do that? And so here's what we do in Krypton. Fundamentally speaking, um, we transfer value as continuous flows over time at finite trading speeds. These trading speeds are the result of a market equilibrium, of supply and demand. The one change in perspective that Krypton has compared to standard economics, to Economics 101, is basically that we formulate demand and supply not as functions mapping price to quantity, but we map price to trading speed. So what that does is, if you want to trade fast because you have a short-lived signal to monetize, then you move the price against you. But the interesting thing is that in equilibrium, it will also move the price and the trading speed. So everyone will see that someone needs to trade very fast, and for whatever reason, they're willing to apparently pay or get a very disadvantageous price. That's a dead giveaway that there's information to monetize. Now, market makers can digest that signal and as soon as possible, just widen their spreads and reduce liquidity. What that does is it stops the bleeding before it has started because the moment the signal is transmitted to the market and prices and trading speeds change, no quantity has been transferred yet. The damage is just starting to happen. If you compare that to traditional central limit order books, whenever someone has a short-lived signal, they simply send a series of messages through the exchange to head every resting limit order at exactly their reservation price, making off with the entire profit. It's wonderful for information efficiency because you know people will see, oh, a large quantity was transferred and the price jumped massively, but it's no consolation to the market maker. These are the worst instances to be a market maker. That's the situation of highest cost to the market maker, when a large chunk of price-relevant news comes out in a short amount of time. And so what we do with Krypton is, because in exactly those instances, we protect the market maker, that means they do not have to make back 
as much from all of us. We do not have to pay the profits of these toxic traders. That's the idea here. So they can charge a lower spread, and that lowers the trading cost. So I know that was a lot, but just to wrap up, what we are looking at is a new paradigm in trading, and it actually is now possible in decentralized finance. So our hope is that um, in a few short months, with the help of uh, modern systems like Avalanche, like Chainlink, like others, this is possible. We can bring it to life. Um, if you're interested, you know, come find me later on at the conference and uh, talk to me. Thank you very much.